All right, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is our last course management webinar of spring. And so I don't want to say I'm excited it's the last one because this has kind of been fun. I sort of missed you guys last week a little bit. It felt like it was a long time. These last two weeks have felt like a long time between them. Uh, but it is getting really nice out. And so I think you guys are probably ready for these to be done. Uh, so I am excited about today's uh, biosecurity is something that we maybe don't think about a lot. But it is something that uh, if we used it and just employed some of the tactics that we're going to share today, I think we could avoid some of the issues that we run into, especially with our horse health a long way. So today, uh, my name is Mary Keena. I'm the Livestock Environmental Management Extension Specialist, and I am based out of the Carrington Research Extension Center for NDSU Extension. And with me, I have uh, Dr. Stucka. And Dr. Stucka is our extension e our extension veterinarian, I was going to say extension equine vet, but he's just all the things. So uh, he's our extension uh, vet. And so he's going to start off with talking to us about some immunity um, issues with horses, just, uh, just how the horse immune system works and what that even means. And then uh, Paige Brumman from the Ward County Extension Office, she's the ANR agent there, is going to talk a little bit about biosecurity. Um, I'm going to come in with some manure, of course. And uh, Rachel Wald from the McKenna County Extension Office, she's the ANR agent there, is gonna um, end us today with some more biosecurity tips. So with that, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna page forward here. Oh, I forgot. Uh, so with us today, we have 35 people registered and there's a handful of you on. Um, and again, this will be recorded. So some of us were having issues with uh, internet earlier. So don't worry about that. We'll record it and then we'll get it sent out to you. So a lot of, again, North Dakota, which is awesome to see. We're so glad you guys are here. Uh, we have a couple of Minnesota and Montana, and then one from India today. So uh, most of the people had four to five horses, and there were a handful of you with 10 to 15, but for the most part, um, everyone on here today had four to five horses is kind of where we're at. So let me slide forward. Okay, and with that, I'm going to give control to Dr. Stucka and he's gonna get us rocking and rolling. So thank you, Mary, thank you, Paige and Rachel, and it's good to be with you this afternoon. I, I'm, uh, I will say that I'm getting a little weary of not being in front of people. I guess we still are, but it's, we're just in front uh, virtual, I suppose. But this is a very interesting topic, and I pu put that background behind my face there just to remind people that I'm <clears throat> much more of a livestock cattle veterinarian than I'm a horse veterinarian. Although, having been in practice in the Cooperstown area, we were sure exposed to quite a number of horses in our practice. And I just want to begin by telling you a little bit of a story that we, we used to run horse vaccination clinics in the spring. And the reason was, was to keep up annual vaccination on, on groups of horses. And we pretty well knew everyone who had at least one horse. And so we'd schedule a date and a time that we were gonna show up at the place and go and vaccinate horses. And, and so we did, that was kind of our spring standard in the country work for a while, trying to get all these horses vaccinated. So one day I'm, I'm on the road, I'm go, pulling up to this place and there's three horses in the pasture. There's two adult horses of normal size and there's one that looks more like a Welsh pony. And so I pull in there to do the vaccination and we, we uh, accomplished our tasks and I was getting ready to leave and the young man that was helping, he was a teenager, he, uh, he asked me if I'd trim the feet on this little Welsh pony, which we managed to accomplish with some difficulty, I would say, but we got enough uh, restraint and we were able to pick up the hooves and, and trim them at least uh, to a certain extent. And finally, I, when we got completely done, I asked this young man who was 15 or 16, I says, I says, do you ever ride this horse? And I, by that, I meant this little Welsh pony. And this Welsh pony had some years on it. There's no doubt about it, probably between 15 and 20 years of age. And you could tell that he was the boss of the horse group, this horse group of three. When I asked him if he ever rode this horse, his answer to me was, I like life which the meaning of it should have been apparent to everybody that's listening. This horse was not only the boss of the other horses, but he was the boss of the people on the place as well. So 
that little story has stuck with me for a long time as we talk about horses and biosecurity and vaccination and health and all those things that go into keeping these horses, whether they're just on the pasture for show and looking at or whether we actually use them for the purpose for which they were intended. So I want to start off with this slide right here because <clears throat> it's a reminder of, of a very important concept <clears throat> that while we have great vaccines in the horse industry, you can't keep all potential pathogens away or what we call harmful biological agents. So there has to be something in place that we call biosecurity, procedures in place that intended to protect not only our animals, but ourselves against disease or harmful agents. And it's very important as we get into this a little bit further, we'll talk about what some of those are and why this biosecurity is important and why vaccination may not be the complete answer. <clears throat> And then finally, we're going to talk about vaccination, and we'll use it in this context. It's, it's actually the process of inoculating an animal or human being with a vaccine to produce immunity against a specific disease. And that little part at the end there, specific disease, we have to remember that's what a vaccine does. It doesn't protect against disease in general. It protects, if the immune system responds, against a very specific antigen very specific protein that's associated with that biological agent or that pathogen. <clears throat> okay. Somehow I got to go to the next slide here. There we go. So you probably didn't enter into this Zoom meeting with the idea that you're going to listen to immunology, but I'm going to make you. And I, and I want, I want to, have you understand what's going on with this slide. It's not like you're going to take a test at the end, but this is really important to understand. <clears throat> there's a, there's a gold colored, at least on my screen, it's gold colored kind of an image that has an AP in the middle of it. And that's AP stands for antigen presenting. In other words, it's a cell that you and I have in our own bodies that the horse has in his or her own body that takes these vaccines or takes parts of a pathogen and internalizes that pathogen and expresses it to the immune system. So that's what I have in those blue stars in that little box with that gold AP, that's a cell, it's an immune system cell. And these little blue stars are what we call antigen. It'd be the same thing as equating that with a vaccine. So I've given this horse a vaccine, the blue stars are the vaccine, they're parts of that potential pathogen, and that AP is internalizing, internalizing that part of the vaccine into its inner parts, if you will. And then what it does, it presents that antigen, you can see that blue star then off to the right of that AP in the next big box. So that antigen presenting cell is presenting that vaccine or that pathogen to the immune system. And that immune system, had, there's a cell there called a T. It's, it's got kind of a star shape. It's got spikes on the outside. It's called a helper T cell. That helps the immune system figure out what it needs to do. So let's say that this is a tetanus toxoid vaccine that I've given in the blue stars. The antigen processing presenting cell takes that blue star, that tetanus toxoid, presents the tex, tetanus toxoid piece to the immune system, and then the immune system does two things with it, okay? It can either go to the, to the bottom here and present it to a B cell, and in the end it produces antibody, and that's what most of us are familiar with. So if I vaccinate a horse with tetanus toxoid, presents the antigen presenting cell, presents it to the immune system, most of the response is gonna be antibody, okay? And that antibody, what that does, it binds, if if a clostridial organism that's associated with tetanus produces this to toxin that can cause tetanus in a horse, that antibody is there. It's there to, to bind that antigen so it can't cause damage to that horse by messing up its musculoskeletal nervous system, okay? On the other hand, if I take a different virus, let's say I'm taking uh, herpes virus, and I present the, not that herpes virus is now in that blue star, presents it to the immune system. 
not only will I get antibody produced, but I'm also going to go up to this top part. It says cell mediated immunity. And that part is really important when it comes to viral infections like herpes viruses, because now I've created a population of immune cells that actually kill virus infected cells. So which vaccine you use, what you're trying to prevent, and how the immune system responds is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be different for a herpes virus. It's going to be different for that tetanus toxin, toxoid vaccine. I hope that makes some sense because the next time you're involved in vaccinating horses, kind of think of this diagram and what's taking place. And of course, it all depends on a functioning immune system. Let me just make one important point. This is like cattle. Uh, this is somewhat like pigs as well. So newborn baby calves, as well as newborn foals, are born essentially without an immune, without immunity. It's not that they can't build immunity, because they can. But early in life, that colostrum, that first milk from the mare, or first milk from the cow, is so essential to setting that foal or that calf up for health, not only in the early stages of life, but later on as well. So I can't overemphasize the importance of colostrum and managing that foal when it's born and making sure it's it nursed and got enough immunity in it to its system because if it didn't, even this part of the immune system doesn't work as well as it should. Okay. All righty. Okay, just this is just another reminder as well. This applies especially to young horses that are receiving their first dose of vaccine or an adult horse that's receiving a vaccine for the first time. This is just a reminder that in most cases, that second dose of vaccine is critical to developing enough immunity in that horse or even a cow or even human beings in order to provide protection. So those lines in there give you an idea, this is antibody level. You give a first dose of a vaccine, they get a little bit of an antibody response, but because there's memory cells created after that first dose, now I've got a whole lot more of those B cells that can build antibody around. So when I give that second dose of a vaccine, whether it's at three weeks or four weeks, or I would even say six, seven, eight weeks later, there's memory cells are still there that can create much more antibody, create a much more powerful immune response. That's how critical those two doses are, especially in naive, naive foals or in, even in naive adult horses. Okay, uh, yeah, so it, let me just talk a little bit about this Eastern, or about core vaccines, okay? This comes directly from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, and I think it's a really sound list, and this list is very sound, basically according to where we live today. If you're living in the Southern Hemisphere, especially as it relates to encephalomyelitis. Then there's another encephalitis virus vaccine that you may want to incorporate, and that's called the Venezuelan encephalomyelitis virus. So, but for our purposes, and in, in our area, in these Northern Plains, Eastern and Western encephalomyelitis, tetanus is critical to, uh, to include on a yearly basis on these horses certainly West Nile virus. Remember that some of these, some of these viruses, not that the horse is necessarily involved in transmitting to human beings because they're not, but some of these viruses because they're transmitted by mosquitoes can also impact humans. West Nile and, and these other encephalomyelitis can, can do that as well. Um, tetanus, as I already indicated, is, is important in annual vaccination. And I would argue that rabies the same. We have skunks in our part of the world, and skunks are the reservoir for rabies. And uh, it's just a very sound vaccination strategy to conclude rabies in your annual vaccination um, protocol. And here's a very important point I want to make about this list right here, is that all of these require individual immunity as none of these are transmitted from horse to horse. It's an important concept to remember. Now, we'll talk a little bit about some other vaccines quickly, but these, you're trying to build individual immunity. You're trying to protect that individual horse, okay? So these vaccines 
And if it's a, if it's a naive animal, they'll in all likelihood require that two doses in order to get them started on the right track. This is just a comment about individual immunity and it's so important to understand this because most of the time a vaccine doesn't actually prevent infection, but it does induce protection against clinical signs. So let's say I vaccinate a horse for West Nile, trying to build immunity in that horse. Can that horse actually get infected? Yes, it can, but because the immune system is heightened and is ready for that challenge, It'll, it'll fight it off so rapidly that you basically never see the clinical signs. So, and, and also that point number two, when, it, when a, an immunized horse is faced with a West Nile virus infection, it requires a higher dose of virus in order to establish that infection. And even if it does become infected, it reduces infectivity after the occurrence of infection. So it, it, it's not gonna last very long in the system. It's not going to shed very long to, uh, to other animals. And so it, it, this individual immunity it, for those diseases that we just talked about, the encephalitis, the West Nile, the te tetanus, the rabies, can't be overemphasized. Uh, these, these are a list from AABP on risk-based and, and depending on where you are, depending on whether your horse travels to shows or not, and so on and so forth, these are certainly optional. The horse is much more resistant to anthrax than, than, than our cattle, but if you're in an area where you've had losses with anthrax, that's one you want to consider. Some of these others, the herpes, the influenza, are, are considerations when you're showing horses and going different places. And then some of these obviously are a little bit down the list in, in, in terms of whether you would consider them or not. Just one comment here, and then I'll finish up, I think, and, and uh, turn it over to, to Paige to talk a little bit more about biosecurity. But as it relates, let me back up one slide. As it relates to some of these viruses here, like herpes virus, like influenza, those would be the, the big two that I would talk about. This is where herd immunity comes in. When we vaccinate, this is be a little bit like coronavirus that's impacting people today. The quicker we can build herd immunity in the United States, the less of an issue this becomes. So it actually, instead of quarantining everybody <laughs> and thinking that you're going to escape, it will better off for the young people that are somewhat just, uh, not immune, but resistant to this to become infected. Because the more people that are immune in a population, the less likely the ones that are susceptible, like the elderly, like the immune suppressed, the less likely they are actually to become infected. So that's, that's a big issue when it relates to like the herpes and the influenza. The more her horses in a population that are immunized against those two viruses that are shed from horse to horse, the less likely it is that a horse that is susceptible will become infected because you, are a you have built herd immunity. I hope that makes sense. And we practice that quite a bit on the cattle side as well. Okay, so perfect. Why do we care about biosecurity? Uh, we want to reduce the chance and the risk of these diseases being brought onto your farm and, and exposing uh, your animals. And they can be brought by people, animals, equipment, vehicles, items like tack and, and uh, brushes, that sort of thing. And you're not going to be able to maybe 100% eliminate the risk, but you can reduce it by implementing some of the things we'll talk about today. The benefits that you're going to see is that you'll have a healthier horse, hopefully fewer vet bills if you have uh, healthier horses and less uh, disease coming through. It's also a human safety issue. There's some of these diseases that are zoonotic, meaning they can be transferred to humans. So it's also a concern of human safety and that's why we want to do our best with biosecurity. And then also it's an environmentally sound decision to manage your manure, manage standing stagnant water, those sorts of things are, are good decisions as well. And we want to point out that it's prevention's best. It's always, you know, easier to prevent things than to deal with treating things after they've been infected. So what are some of the challenges specific to horse owners and stable managers and event centers? 
Well, some of these places depend on public traffic to their barn. So if you are giving lessons, if you're training horses, you're hosting horse shows and events, you can't just shut down and say nobody can come to your facility ever. And that's how you're gonna keep some of these risks down. Some of these places rely on frequent participation in shows and events. If you're a rodeo competitor, a horse show competitor, a trainer that is competing and exhibiting, again, you can't just stay home. Um, you're gonna have some exposure. You wanna be aware and consider some of the risks and losses that can occur from outbreaks, just so you can think through all of these things. There can be an economic loss. Treating uh, diseases and illnesses can be expensive. There's an emotional loss, an emotional toll on the owners and these facility, horse owners and facility managers. Um, it can be stressful. It can affect the reputa reputation of these facilities. And sometimes it can be life-threatening to the horses. So specifically, think about people that come onto your property and you can categorize them into different risk levels. So low risk would be people that don't own horses and rarely visit rural agricultural areas. So maybe a field trip coming from a school or a city or relatives uh, that don't live in a rural area, they'd be low risk visitors. Medium risk visitors would be people that maybe frequently attend farms or go to farms in rural areas, but they don't have real direct contact with horses. So think of people delivering feed and shavings, uh, maybe some repairmen coming out. And then our high risk visitors are gonna be people that regularly make trips to horse farms and have close contact with the animals. These will be your vets, farriers, trainers, maybe other horse owners um, and neighbors that have horses. And I think it wouldn't be unusual and it may be a good idea to visit with those people that are in that high risk category, especially if you're not the first stop of the day uh, maybe your fairy has been to somebody else's facility. Ask them if they have um, be willing to wash their hands, maybe if they have a change of clothes. Those sort of things are good ideas to implement. Some management strategies for visitors. Keep a visitor log. That way, if there's an outbreak at your facility, you're able to notify people. You can provide hand sanitizer, hand washing stations, and boot washing stations. Clearly mark off areas where you don't want visitors to go. So if you have uh, high risk animals, maybe a uh, mare and foal, maybe an animal that is sick, make sure that you mark off those areas that visitors are not to enter. Set up some parking areas that are away from your feed storage and manure sources and see if you have a dog policy stated. If dogs are welcome on your place, do they need to be leashed? Do they need to be, make sure that they stay out of some of the areas on the property? I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. She is going to talk a little bit about a vector um, as it pertains to manure and manure management. Okay, let me just scoot us out of the way so I can see, perfect. Okay, so the first uh, vector then that we're going to talk about. <laughs> What's going the wrong way? The first vector we're going to talk about is manure. And so uh, manure can harbor pathogens. That is something that we've talked about in previous um, uh, webinars. And so those webinars that the, specifically the manure management one is linked here at the end uh, in the resources. So you can go back and get the full manure download. Uh, but manure can harbor pathogens and so um, it, and it's also a breeding ground for insects. Both um, internal and external uh, parasites are something that we worry about. Uh, insects carry and or transfer diseases. And so you can see here that we have a uh, what would have been an internal parasite and then we have our flies, our external biting parasites as well. So um, of course, there's the manure management side of things that I mostly talk about. So I talk about the manure con containing valuable nutrients. It's, um, there's nutrients in there that plants need. And if, they don't, if we don't manage them, they become an issue. And so um, Paige had touched on it earlier, it's, it's an environmental issue. Um, so that's where we have excess soil nutrients. We have some potential runoff. They become a, a soil and a water pollutant. However, there's other considerations for manure too, not just from an environmental standpoint, but from an animal standpoint, and specifically today, a biosecurity or disease standpoint. So we have the bacteria and pathogens, 
um, flies and internal parasites like to breed in manure. And so that is something where if we manage our manure, we can also then manage our fly and parasite populations. Uh, rodents really like manure, especially when it's warm. It's a nice warm area and in North Dakota, they don't get that too often. Um, odors and weed seeds. And so those are just some other management considerations when you're dealing with manure. Uh, so there's a four options we're gonna roll, roll through today. So uh, manure management options. And again, you can get all of the details in the manure management webinar. So dry lotting, stockpiling, spreading, and I put rotate in here and we'll talk about that and then composting. So just some quick considerations for dry lot. Um, and this one was more so talked about in the grazing webinar where we have a dry lot area or some people call it a sacrifice area. So basically we're giving up a piece of land um, to use for putting our animals in instead of using that for pasture, but we're using that area all the time. Um, and so that's an area that's gonna become full of manure and we're going to have to manage that manure. And so um, soil characteristics and structure are something that we want to keep in mind when we're looking at a dry lot area, how do we want to, um, how do we want to maintain the structure of that uh, ground that we're on? Clay versus sand, so that's going to be a pollution issue. So we want clay because it's less permeable. And then uh, hoof traffic is something else too that we have to keep in mind. What can handle extra hoof traffic on there? What's going to stand up to having several horses around? Um, ease of use. So if you're going to use a dry lot area, it, is it useful? Is it easy for you to use? It is, is it accessible? Or is it something that you're like, well, our dry lot area is over there, not anywhere close to any of the rest of the things we do, so it's harder for us to manage our manure, so we just don't use it. Uh, and so those are just some things to keep in mind as you're going through and deciding if you're going to have uh, a dry lot or not. And the manure collection, um, most people say should be weekly, some do it daily, uh, some do it every couple weeks, and so I'd say the more often you collect your manure and manage that area, the cleaner it's going to be and the less issues you should have. Okay, so here's an example of why to dry lot. So you can see that this was an early spring picture. It was raining out. It was muddy because we were thawing, and I put this up here for a couple reasons. One, we're saving those pastures. You can see the green in the background. If, you, if we had horses just running everywhere, it would all look like this and we don't want that. We want those pastures for grazing. However, when we look at this, we think maybe we could change the footing. Maybe we could change the structure. Maybe we could change the slope of these pens so that uh, you can see in the back, there's some, uh, some pooling of water. And so maybe we can use this picture as a good example of how to change um, how we're dry lotting, but then also the manure that's in there. Um, manure is something that we want to make sure we're considering in this dry lot. Are you managing it? Are you able to get in there and manage it? Um, is it dry enough that when you are using the dry lot, everything is draining correctly so that you can get in and manage it? If not, you're going to have horses um, that end up with manure up to their hips. And sometimes that's going to happen. It's North Dakota. No matter what we do, uh, sometimes that just happens. But we can walk through the steps of mitigating those issues. Okay, so another thing we talked about was manure stockpiling or some people call it stacking. And so um, there's some rules and guidelines in North Dakota that we should follow. So short-term manure stockpiles are anything that is um, stockpiled and, and maintained in one area for nine months. It cannot be there for more than nine months. And you cannot use that same location from year to year. The second option is a permanent manure stockpile. And that's something that has, uh, you can use for more than nine months in the same location, so you can use it all the time, but you do have to go through some soil investigation and some regulatory oversight to make sure that that is in fact the best area on your operation to have that permanent manure. And that's just because of the initial uh, manure considerations I talked about with the, the leaching and potential pollution issues. So sandy soils have rapid permeability, and we've talked about this before. Uh, so we, we want to, they allow the nitrogen or the nitrate to flow through really quickly and we want to avoid that. So that's what we call leaching. Uh, well, the loamy or clay soils have a slower permeability. So basically they just help to maintain, uh, they, they hold those nutrients there and then we're actually able to take those nutrients and move them off then to uh, an appropriate place. Or if it's in our stockpile already, so that would be if it's in a dry lot. If it's in our stockpile already, we're able to maintain that until we go spread or compost that manure. 
So um, common sense, right? Don't put it in a gravel pit, other excavations along streams or lakes, basically anywhere where you think, hmm, um, if it rained, it could flood. And if it, um, if I put it here, it might potentially affect water. Those are places to not put your stockpile area. Okay, so now you have this stockpile of manure and you wanna spread it. So spreading is another option and you can spread raw manure. It is not something that we necessarily recommend. If you go to the parasite webinar, uh, which was one that we gave two weeks ago, we talk a little bit more there about um, spreading raw manure versus spreading composted manure and how to manage that. And if you're going to rotate pastures as you're grazing, or if you're gonna rotate um, and you're not gonna have those animals on, uh, something that you're going to be grazing where you spread that manure, then it's okay. Go ahead and spread your raw manure. But we really want to watch that. We really want to uh, make sure that we're maintaining that rotational schedule. So if you are going to spread and you're working with a custom hauler, so something big, uh, we have something big that we're working with. We have a lot of manure or we have a few years of manure. Um, something that we have in the state are custom manure haulers, and there are actually several states that have them. So what we want to do is just make sure that we are um, when we work with them, we have a place to spread the manure. We know how much it's going to cost. We know how much manure is there and all of this stuff you can find in the very first manure webinar where we go through the calculations of knowing how much you're actually going to have so you know what to tell them when they come. And uh, one of the biggest parts and the reason I put this in here is because if you're going to do a stockpiling area, it's really important to make sure that if you're using a custom hauler, this kind of equipment fits these trucks and these tractors are what they're gonna come with. However, there's at-home spreading options too. And so maybe you have just a couple horses or you spread often um, or you, you just wanna do it yourself. That's totally fine too. So there are smaller, more uh, pull type options, uh, ground-driven spreaders. Um, you can use an ATV, uh, lawnmower. Some people use horses uh, for spreading their manure. And so there's a handful of then these little at-home manure spreaders as well. So you may have gathered if you've been on a few of these now um, that composting, of course, is one of my favorite management techniques. Um, so what the heck is compost? It's a mixture of organic residues. It's been piled, mixed, moistened, and decomposed. So it uses heat. So thermophilic is a heat loving process where uh, we have uh, heat mixed with all the other things that we talked about, some carbon and some nitrogen, uh, which means that we have the wood shavings and the manure uh, mixed together to make a crumbly low odor substance. It's nutrient stable and it decreases the volume. So that's great for you uh, because there's less to spread, so less to worry about. Okay, so the benefits of composting. We reduce our weed seeds. That's big, especially in our pastures if we're maintaining them. We reduce our pathogens, something that we're talking about today with biosecurity, that's big. Uh, we also reduce our nutrient loss and increase our nutrient stability, big things. And then something else I added to this one I don't normally have in here is we're reducing our flies and parasite populations. Again, with a biosecurity issue, with parasite issues, with horse health, all important things. And then I just put in here as the last couple of slides, uh, reducing weed problems. And so there's the, I'm not necessarily gonna go through this, but this is just to show you the temperature. So when we're composting, we're typically, typically getting our compost between 130 and 150 degrees. And this actually goes through and shows you then uh, what kind of weed seeds are killed during that process at that temperature. But then also the American Association of Equine Practitioners says that there's very little, it actually says no development, um, above 104 degrees Fahrenheit for internal parasites. So not only are we getting rid of the weeds, not only are we stabilizing the nutrients, we are also getting rid of those parasites too. And then of course, there's always off-farm disposal as an option uh, for keeping our pens clean and being the most biosecure we can. Uh, so we have um, the soil conservation districts, maybe you wanna talk to them. We have some local vegetable growers that are always looking for uh, a really great fertilizer product like manure. Some landfills will take it, um, potentially community compost projects, and then working again with a custom manure hauler. And I just wanna go back here. Um, Something else that we, you know, we talk about with biosecurity, most of the time we're thinking animal health and um, the live animal, but I think that biosecurity can also be weed seeds too, because we are spreading um, this, this plant around or the state potentially. So if we're using a, a custom hauler 
and they come in, we want to make sure when they come in, we tell them, this is how I expect your equipment to look when you get here. Now, is it going to be pristine and perfect? Probably not. These guys haul manure every day. But do I expect them to come in with, um, if they come in with stuff on their wheels, it, it, just like Paige talked about, like, how do you want this stuff to look when it comes into your yard and what do you allow into your yard? Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. So whether that's weed seeds or manure, um, important to keep in mind. With that, I am going to let Paige take back over. Okay. <clears throat> so next we're going to talk about uh, rodents as a vector. So rodents in North Dakota, you know, we'd be looking at mice, rats, gophers, moles, voles, squirrels, those sorts of things are considered rodents. They can carry diseases, bacteria, um, ticks, fleas, mites, intestinal parasites, those sorts of things. They cause a lot of damage in spoiling feed and consuming feed, and they can also cause damage to your buildings. They can be a fire hazard when they're chewing through walls and, and tearing up insulation. So what can we do to prevent them? Uh, the, probably the most popular thing is to make sure you're storing your feed in hard-sided containers. Most of our feed comes in paper bags or plastic bags that rodents can easily chew through um, and set up shop and have quite a, a buffet line. So make sure you're sealing those in hard containers. Keep your garbage covered. Eliminate any holes in buildings that are larger than a quarter inch. Plug those either with more insulation, um, wire mesh, uh, more siding, those are options. Keep your weeds and long grass around your buildings trimmed, especially in the fall time as we go into winter. Make sure that you uh, really reduce the height because they are going to use that to hide and to burrow into. Remove hiding places like wood piles and any clutter around the place that can house rodents as well. As far as controlling go goes, just about every farm and barn is going to have a small population of rodents. We want to keep it under control. And one way to do that would be traps, poisons, there's different fumigations and other rodent control options out there. I do want to note that if you're using these items, make sure that you're following the label very specifically. Um, they are, they do pose a risk to human health and other pets, children, that sort of thing. So make sure that you're following the labels and being cautious when you're using those. Another option we see a lot of people have to control rodents is have barn cats. And a few barn cats can really help keep the population down. But if you um, have an uncontrolled population of barn cats, they can actually become a vector and a bit of a pest as well. Next vector we're going to talk about is birds. And there's a variety of different birds that can carry diseases. In order to prevent birds, keep in mind that they are drawn to an easy source of food. So again, keeping your grains covered and even your haze as much as possible. Cover that garbage container again and keep your manure and compost piles covered and, or at least away from the facility. If you're feeding a lot of whole grains to your horses, birds will uh, dig around in the manure and feed off of that. And if you do have spills, because every facility typically does, try to clean them up as soon as possible. If you have a high population of birds that are um, causing problems on your facility, consider maybe some netting to keep them out of your barn. There are a lot of things on the market as far as noisemakers and visual repellents, things like hanging an owl or a scarecrow, um, hanging pie plates or CDs. All of these are temporary solutions that don't typically work long time. The birds come very accustomed to them. They might work for a couple hours or even a couple days if you're lucky and then they figure out that it's not a real threat and, and they set up shop again. So keep that in mind. There is an option to use pesticides to control birds, but what you do wanna make sure is that you're using a product that is legal to use in the state of North Dakota and that you're using it against a bird species that is legal to use it on. Um, a good source for that information would be the North Dakota Department of Agriculture website. And there's a link there for the Kelly Solutions website, which will give you a list of all of the pesticides that are labeled for use in North Dakota. And then also there's natural enemies of birds that sometimes people try to discourage from coming onto their property. I think predator uh, birds, and again, some of those cat populations can reduce the population, although probably minimally at best. The next disease vector we're going to talk about is insects and we covered this a little bit more in depth on the last webinar. 
but insects um, are going to be uh, carriers of things like West Nile and EIA. Um, and they're going to breed, especially in the summer months, and are, a lot of them breed in either manure, which Mary talked about, or wet standing water areas. So to prevent them, store feed, any spoiled things like manure compost, grain that got wet, clean up spills quickly, get rid of stagnant water, and clean out your feed and water buckets regularly. Every place is going to have some level of insects. So what can we do to get rid of the ones that develop into mature insects? Well, we can use feed additives that have IGR insect growth regulators that will inhibit the larva from developing into adult flies. Fly predator wasp are another option. Keep in mind that you don't wanna use both of those options together. So if you give the feed additive that is going to kill the insect, um, or kill the developing larva, and then you also are using the predator wasp, you may end up killing your predator wasps. So one or the other, or rotate their use. You can use screens to keep them physically out of the barn, uh, physical barriers on your horses, such as fly sheets, fly masks, and boots or leggings. And then of course, there's a whole bunch of uh, sprays and repellents that are contain insecticides that can either kill the fly on contact or they can repel them slightly for temporary periods of time. Landscaping solutions to use would be, uh, say if you have a, a pond at your facility, maybe you can get that water moving, um, put an aerator or a pump in to reduce breeding grounds, um, draining standing water or dumping out buckets that are tires that are collecting small amounts of standing water. And then the last thing we put up there is traps. And traps we talked about before, while they may be uh, really exciting to see your gallon pail full of, or gallon, gallon jug full of flies, that's really, really um, very few flies that you're actually catching in the environment. So while they may look rewarding, they're best used in small enclosed areas like tack rooms or smaller barns. Um, setting traps outside typically is not gonna be effective at reducing the population significantly. Briefly, we'll talk about other wildlife in North Dakota. We'll start with the unwelcome ones, and Dr. Stucker briefly talked about skunks being a, a leading carrier of uh, rabies and transmitting that to horses, and raccoons are often also unwelcome as well. But what about the good wildlife? Hawks and other predatory birds can cut down on your rodent population and some of the smaller birds. Non-venomous snakes, like our bull snakes, they also uh, consume insects and rodents, as well as our gardener snakes. And then fish and frogs are desirable as well. Okay, so that kind of wraps up our discussion about vectors. We're going to move into talking about some biosecurity options while hauling. So the first thing we to remember is to be clean your trailer out after each time you use it. Get rid of that manure and, and compost it properly. Disinfect your trailer regularly both inside and out, and regularly is gonna depend on how much you use it. If you're hauling daily or multiple times a week, you're gonna to wanna to disinfect much more frequently than if you're maybe only hauling once or twice a year to do a little bit of trail riding. Keep in mind that hauling is stressful to most horses and stress affects the immune response. And another thing to keep in mind when hauling is to allow that horse to lower their head to clear their airway regularly. So if you have them tied up short with their head tied up a little higher, they're unable to um, cough and to clear their respiratory system. While you're traveling away from home, remind yourself that typically outbreaks spread much more rapidly at large group events. So think about things before you travel to make sure you're not bringing the disease to an event. Check your horse prior to travel, take their temperature, and don't transport a sick animal. And make sure your vaccines are current to protect against disease spread. When you're at the event, stay separated as best you can. Try not to group house your horse with other animals. Minimize that nose-to-nose -nose contact when you're riding or kind of standing around and visiting. Um, don't let your horses uh, sniff their nose right to another horse. If you can, um, while stalling, if room allows at the facility, try to separate those stalls with a tack stall or a feed stall so your horse isn't having nose-to-nose -nose contact with another horse from another facility. As far as equipment goes, as much as we like to, to share and be friendly and helpful, don't share your supplies and tack with other people. 
If you must, make sure you disinfect them before. Rachel's gonna talk a little bit about how to do that later. Um, before you use them and then disinfect again before returning them to whoever you borrow the product from. So that includes things like feed and water buckets, uh, tack, grooming supplies, nerf forks, wheelbarrows, all of those things that can be fomites for different diseases. And then while you're away from home, keep a vital signs chart before you leave, during the event, and after you return from the event. And usually the recommendation is to check their temperature at least once a day, twice a day is even better. So what about new horses coming onto your place? Whether you're boarding horses, have a friend staying over for a weekend, or you purchased a new horse, it's recommended that you quarantine these animals for a minimum of two weeks. And the longer you can do it, the better. So if you can quarantine for three weeks or four weeks, that's even better. Quarantine means keeping them away from nose to nose contact with horses. So not just merely putting them in another pasture next to the horses where they can um, reach over the fence or through the fence, separate them as far away as possible. So if you can get a couple hundred feet away from where the other horses are at, that would be more desirable. Don't have these new horses in common areas. So don't bring them into your wash rack, your round pen, the tie rail where you tie all the other horses along the side of the arena, cross ties, those sort of areas. And again, it's recommended to monitor new horse temperatures daily while in quarantine. Also, it'll help to have the history of that new animal. So if it was purchased, was it purchased at a sale auction facility? or was it purchased private treaty? If it was purchased privately from another horse owner, did it come off of a facility where they had a closed herd where no horses had been coming or going, or was it a horse that had been you know, recently exhibited or being hauled regularly for the past few months? So knowing that history lets you assess the risk level. Some other uh, considerations that I just wanna share with you is some of these things to think about when you're at away from home or even when you're at home and are having inter new horses introduced. Communal water sources are um, becoming less popular than they used to be, but it's still not unusual to pull up to a, a rodeo or a horse show or a trail ride and have a big tank of water that all the horses are led up to or, or ridden up to and drink out of. Avoid that at all costs if you can. Um, that's a really easy way to spread disease amongst horses. Bring a pail of your own and fill it up from a hydrant or a hose. When you're using a hose, avoid letting the end of that hose hang out in the water tank or the pail. Uh, the hose then becomes a fomite that transfers disease from pail to pail to pail. So keep that in mind. These are just a couple common things that, that we see. While co-mingling of horses um, may not always be easy at events, um, try not to tie them right next to another horse um, or again allowing that nose to nose contact. And then a lot of the shared equipment that we don't always think about, um, you kind of have to develop a habit of thinking about all these areas and what you can do to reduce your risk. So face rags is a common one. Um, somebody comes up and says, hey, can I borrow that rag? I just need to wipe some snot off of my horse's uh, face. And they do so, they give it back to you, you use it on your horse and you just transmitted um, a respiratory disease or a bacteria like strangles. Um, buckets are another area. Oh, I forgot my water pail or my feed pail at home. Can I use yours? Um, not ideal unless you're gonna be disinfecting before and after use. We haven't focused a lot on skin diseases like the fungus and bacteria that can be transferred through girths and saddle pads and brushes, but that's a common area for issues to pop up as well. So again, don't share those things. And even at home, if you're using um, the same girth and saddle pad amongst many horses, disinfect those regularly and clean those regularly so that you don't end up spreading diseases through horses. Halters and bridles are another common area. You think that that bit that goes into their mouth and then if you immediately take it out and put it in another horse's mouth, you can be transferring diseases that way as well. So just some things to, to think about. So it all kind of sounds like a lot, and we come down with the question of how strict do you need to be about these things? And really it's up for you to decide. Um, are you competing regularly on a horse that it's very important to you that they not come down with uh, influenza or strangles or something like that? Or do you have a pasture or companion animal that maybe you only haul 
once or twice a year to go on a trail ride and then it returns home to a small closed herd of only a couple other animals that that don't do a lot of hauling or competing. There's going to be a difference in the level of biosecurity that you want to implement for these animals. The value of the horse sometimes comes into play and the value of lost training or competition time if that horse becomes ill. And then also think about the cost of treatment of for a specific disease versus the cost of the prevention measures or sometimes what we think of as kind of a hassle of presenting preventing diseases and implementing biosecurity measures. Regularly evaluate your protocols because every horse facility is unique, every horse owner is unique, and those plans should be tailored to fit your needs. If you're a small facility, maybe you can say, no, I'm not gonna let anybody come onto my place. If you're a large boarding facility, you host shows and clinics, or maybe you're a horse trainer, that isn't going to be um, as easy to do, but you can still set up guidelines and rules that you're gonna follow to minimize your risk. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and she's gonna talk specifically about how to disinfect items on your farm. Okay, so now that Paige has covered everything um, off farm while you are out doing your showing or your rodeoing or whatever else works, she talked about disinfecting um, your trailers or, or cleaning out those areas as you go places. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, disinfecting your farm. It's important to do both, both the trailer and the farm. Um, and when you come home, if you have several different horses, you know, maybe 15 or 20 and you've got, been gone for a week with one at a show, especially if it's a big show, you wanna take that horse and put him in a secluded area by himself um, for a week to 10 days, just so that if anything does come up, um, his symptoms uh, will show up in that time and you will be able to manage that disease better because he, that horse will, will have not gone to the rest of your herd. Um, so this will help, um, it will be a little bit more labor initially, but if, if something were to happen, this would be less labor than if, and if your whole herd had gotten it. Um, so the first thing would be setting up away from, setting up a, a space away from other horses, making sure that it's easy to disinfect. Um, disinfectants work, work best on clean surfaces. So if you guys have ever gone into a stall and you see that there's poop on the walls, that poop has to be removed before you start cleaning and disinfecting. Um, so one of the rule of thumbs that, that I have heard is clean before you disinfect. So make sure you get all of the, the excess debris off, um, any organic material like feces um, gets out of there and, and keeping everything clean before, before you start disinfecting. Make sure you're using a disinfectant that is horse safe and then following the label instructions for use. Um, you never wanna mix any products together that aren't supposed to be mixed together because they can create toxic gases they can cause fires um, and become more toxic to people as you're cleaning. So that's one thing to keep in mind as well. So in the process is remove everything from that stall, sweep out any debris, move or, remove that organic material, wash the walls and floors with a regular detergent, and then you apply the disinfectant as label, the label instruction and do not rinse. So here's a quick um, disinfectant guide and this, this is some of your common ones. Um, the phenols and cre creosols um, work well in the presence of organic materials. So if you do have an, an instance where you're not able to, to get everything out of there, um, say it's a, a, a stall with sand at the bottom instead of, instead of cement, that's another, another issue. Um, chlorines and hypochlorates is essentially bleach. Um, those are what I would use on your brushes, buckets, um, and any other materials that you can, you can dump in and soak for a little bit. When you're doing that, I do like to air dry those just to get them to a place where, where it's, it's real easy. The other side of that is um, getting them out in the sunlight too. Sunlight is an awesome, awesome, benefit when you're looking to disinfect and dry and get rid of some of the, the 
things that fomites might carry, fomites being those buckets, brushes, and feed pans. Um, betadine is one exception to that rule. Um, sunlight, that's why it's in a dark bottle. Sunlight and organic material actually inactivate it. And then chlorhexene, also known as Novasan, is might be something that you guys are pretty familiar with because you can also clean wounds with that, but you can also use it as, a, as something to put in a spray bottle and, and spray any surface as well to help disinfect. And I know that's hard. Um, some of these materials that we do are a little bit harder to do, like brushes. I want to make sure to do brushes if you're especially traveling quite a bit. I would say do those brushes at least at least twice a year if you're traveling quite a bit. Um, do not share any of your brushes, obviously, as Paige had mentioned. But your your buckets, your feed pans, as you're going places, um, as you come home, that's the number one thing. Get those bleached, air dry them, um, and then get them back into your trailer so that it's it, they're ready to go for the next season. Um, so as you're handling sick horses, you want to either if they've been in your herd, promptly remove the sick horse from other horses, or if you're bringing them back, um, make sure just to just to keep them out of your sick horse or your horse herd. Um, with sick horses, you want separate buckets, separate halters, feed pans, grooming tools. All of those need to be something that you have off to the side. Um, obviously separate housing, somewhere where they cannot touch nose to nose or share any communal water sources or any hay sources. So across the fence is not, is not enough. They almost have to be um, possibly on the other side of the farm. And you wanna treat and care for the sick horse last so as you're going out, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are worried they got to check on the sick horse. Go through your, your normal chores first and do that sick horse last uh, because the worst thing to happen would be for you to go and treat that sick horse first and then essentially spread it through, through your hands or your boots or anything else to the rest of your herd. So anytime the vet comes out, um, healthy horses first, same with the farrier and any other family members. You want to change or disinfect clothing and footwear in between. So if you're done for the day and you do your sick horse last, um, either change into clothes that you've been using for that sick horse, clothes and boots that you've been using for that sick horse, or after you're done, make sure that you are washing those clothes and, and washing your boots off before the next day starts. Washing hands is also number one. That's for us as well as horses. Make sure you get your hands washed too. So additional habits to adopt, um, like Paige had said, new horses, um, take a temperature every day, learn how to do vital signs. Um, and then also, if you're planning on taking your horse somewhere, having a standard uh, vital sign set up before you leave so that you know when they are stressed or when something's coming, you can see that in their vital signs beforehand. Um, so real quick, temperature on a horse is between 99 and 101. Those are pretty normal areas. The pulse, you're gonna see anywhere from 28 to 44. And actually the more fit your horse is, the lower that's going to be. And then your respirations are between 10 and 24 uh, breaths per minute. And then another good one that I like to check on the regular is that you just pick up that lip to check their mucous membranes. So their gums, make sure they're nice and pink and healthy um, and moist. You can push on their gums and pull away and then count how many seconds it'll take for that. That spot that your finger indented into um, comes back to their normal color. Um, and that's, that's another piece of the vital sign that you can add to that too. So on this horse here, I have some red lines. These are areas that you can, you can get to. Um, it just depends on where the best spot for your horse is to take a pulse. The first one is, is underneath that jawbone, kind of on the medial side, medial meaning middle. So the, one, the side of the jawbone that is facing the inside of the, the throat. Um, that's one spot to take it. The next is their jugular vein uh, right along that groove on the lower part of their neck. And then the pastern on the front part of the, I'm uh, sorry, the back part of the front leg. And then you can also check, um, not all horses are easily done by this one, but it's essentially the femoral artery um, on the inside of the leg. 
the back leg. So you want to learn how to take your vital signs, chart them regularly. Some horses are easier than others. It just depends on what site's best for, for that horse. We don't want to share any needles um, and then treat ill horses last. So that's kind of just those good habits to keep on the regular, not just uh, when you have a sick horse. So these are some of the resources that we'd utilized and I know you mentioned that uh, vital signs chart frequently and the actually the first source there has a chart that you can certainly take with you and use at events. Perfect. Looks like we have a question in the chat box. Dr. Stucker, are you still with us? Would you like to unmute yourself and address that question? I am here, Paige. Let me see. So the question is, is why do horses need oh. four vaccines every year, whereas humans and dogs and cats yeah. aren't needed every year? A great question, actually. You know, in, the, in truth, if, if there was a way that we could detect whether an animal's carrying protective immunity or not, we may not have to vaccinate horses every year. Um, one of the reasons that we do, especially for things like Eastern and Western encephalitis and West Nile is that we want to heighten their immunity at a time when we're going to get a lot of mosquito pressure. It, we can't control mosquitoes very well at all, even though we try. And remember that those viruses actually the reservoirs in bird populations. If we could actually vaccinate mosquitoes and or birds, we'd probably have a better chance of maybe not having to vaccinate horses every year, but because we don't and because the horse and humans are essentially dead end hosts, in other words, we don't transmit it to anybody else, we wanna maintain that individual immunity just as high as we can. So, I mean, it's up to people whether they decide they need it every year or not, it really is. It's just that these recommendations for vaccination programs probably take a conservative approach and we never know how well a horse vaccinates or immunizes on the day we vaccinate it. If we had a way to measure that, that would give us a little more confidence perhaps that I don't need to vaccinate every year. Uh, rabies the same, you know, it's possible you could go a couple of years without rabies, vaccines, tetanus may be the same, but we just don't know the answers to that uh, that can give us some idea, is my horse protected or not? So sometimes the default is just buying a little insurance and it's relatively inexpensive in my mind. And one of the things I just learned putting this together is that there's now Eastern and Western tetanus and rabies all in one vaccine. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. And in order to, to have a vaccine that's labeled that way, they have to make sure that when they, they give them all in combination, that they're not impacting negatively the other parts of that vaccine. So uh, it's become more convenient than ever. Rather than three different doses or four or two, you can actually do the cores in just one vaccine. That's one thing I guess I hadn't kept up with uh, on, the, on the horse side. So it's convenient. You're buying a little insurance. Gives you confidence, I think, in the care of your horse that you're not missing something or putting that horse at risk. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Stucka. If there's any other questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box or you could even unmute your microphone and ask them verbally if you wish. Up right now on the screen, we have a, a poll in action. So if you wanna select your answer and we got one more question to ask, and we'll wrap up our polling. I did forget to add one more thing um, to have a vet box handy in your trailer, in your barn, um, or just in your house. And with that, I, I would highly suggest um, you can get thermometers for five bucks, uh, get a thermometer in each location and a, and a stethoscope. They're, they're pretty easy um, to have and to work. So get those ready to go. Um, one thing that's really nice is to have an alcohol swab ready after you're done using it on your horse and just swab those off and let them air dry and that will, that will keep them clean for when you need to use them again. Awesome. So um, as Paige is finishing out the polls there, just want to let you know that, like I said earlier, this is our last one for the spring. 
uh, but we are planning some winter uh, series. And so that was one of the questions that Paige had asked is the likelihood that you guys will join us for a winter series. And so if you want to in the chat box, we have a, a few ideas already floating around just between us here. Um, but if you have some thoughts and ideas on things you'd like to share, we'd sure like you to put that in the chat box. Um, things that you would like to know during a winter series like this. And so we're thinking the December timeframe. Uh, so if there are specific things in the winter you really wish you had more information on, that would be a, a great for us to know. So pop them in the chat box or send us an email. Of course, you can always do that. If you think of something later, you can always let us know. Uh, with that, Paige, are the polls good? All right, yes. so the yep. polls are good. And I think there are no more questions. I haven't seen any come in here. So unless anyone else has a question or wants to put anything in the chat box as far as a topic, I think we will wrap up this series. Okay. Thank you everyone right. for joining us today. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks guys. Yes, thank you all. Thank you.